This is Dr. Mark Jennings in his teaching on the Gospel of Mark. This is session number 15 on Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 50. Transfiguration, Boy with Demon, Discipleship. Be with you again as we continue to work through the Gospel of Mark. Uh, Today we're getting into Mark chapter 9. Uh, specifically, we'll be starting with uh, verse 2. But as we begin to uh, think about Mark chapter 9, the first incident we're going to look at is one of the more uh, well-known, is the transfiguration of Jesus. And as we work through the transfiguration, remember we're also working through this not as an event in and of itself, but also how Mark has been preparing us for the transfiguration and what the transfiguration itself prepares us for. So let's uh, read the text, has been our custom, and then discuss uh, you know, what, um, what's in there. So beginning with verse 2. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, They no longer saw anyone with him but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come, that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they please, as it is written of him. When we come to the transfiguration here, one of the things that uh, immediately stands out is there are some interesting parallels uh, between this event and Moses going up on the mount. For example, Jesus takes disciples up with him. He takes, he takes the three disciples here that we've come to know as part of his inner circle. Moses also goes up uh, onto the mountain, takes three unnamed figures with him along with uh, 70 others. Jesus is transfigured. His clothes become radiantly white. And, you know, even Mark gives us this uh, evidence about as white as uh, it was impossible to make by bleaching. Moses' skin shines when he descends from the mountain after talking with God. And, and both God appears in, in, in an overshadowing cloud. There is a, a, um, uh, that um, uh, uh, theophany, if you will, uh, in, in the Old Testament, but here as well. We even see some people being astonished. The disciples are astonished at what has happened, and, and, and so are um, uh, the, the people when they see Moses coming down. But there are, uh, in, in the middle of these references and, and similarities to Moses, and there's a few more even, it's certainly a place in the sense of how uh, the Mosaic uh, moment is lesser than what is happening here with, with Jesus. So as we think through this, I want to try to show some of these elements and how they play out. You know, one of the things as we work through is, again, these first three We've been accustomed. These are the ones who are allowed to see what happened to Jairus' daughter when, when she was dead. Um, and so and they've seen that amazing miracle. Now they've seen this transfiguration. These will also be the three that Jesus takes with him at Gethsemane a little bit further. And, and, it's, and as we think through that what these three are seeing, we need to remember also that in terms of, of the confusion that these three are said to demonstrate. Peter often with, uh, as, uh, as a um, spokesperson for the Twelve. But even John, later on, will ask some questions where, that will um, show that they're seeing all these amazing things, but they're yet not still fully understanding. 
What's interesting is as as they're they're moving up into this into this mount, um, that Mark tells us that Elijah with Moses was seen there talking with Jesus. So here, uh, Jesus has been transfigured and he's he's uh, in in glory and and you know part of the idea is wondering is is um, uh, is this what they're actually seeing is almost the true sense of the of the glory of, of Jesus. Um, or, or um, has has Jesus sometimes his anticipated glorious figure that will that he will be uh, when he comes into glory? What is actually being seen? But regardless, there's this glory that is being seen, and you have Elijah and Moses. Now, the order is fascinating. Elijah with Moses. Uh, in fact, usually you would, as you would expect, it'd be Moses, you know, with Elijah because of the primacy of Moses. Uh, I think the the Mark puts Elijah first, where the uh, the others do not. Part of stressing, I think, the eschatological moment that is here, but also the conversation that has with Elijah. But this, uh, the fact that Elijah and Moses there uh, are uh, shouldn't be a surprise, and we do need to ask the question: Why those two? And and I don't think the answer is because they represent the law and the prophets. I don't think that's necessarily the answer, or at least a full, complete. Moses certainly would, would represent the law, but Elijah it would be an odd choice for representing the prophets. Uh, he, he was a prophet, um, but in terms of what we think of the law and the prophets, usually think of the, the prophetical books that were written. So one like Isaiah might have been more anticipated. And even then it's not as clear because Moses is considered a prophet as well. So it's not as if Moses is... Uh, lacking uh, prophet designation. In fact, Deuteronomy 18 speaks of the one who would come like the prophet Moses. And I think maybe that's where we start to understand some of the reasons why Elijah and Moses might be the ones here. That uh, both of them had a a theophany experience on a mountain, no less. um, Both of them factor into the um, eschatological anticipation. You know, Elijah, you know, Malachi 4, 5 speaks of Elijah's return and look forward to the days of Elijah. Deuteronomy 18 uh, speaks forward for when the one who's a prophet like Moses would come. And so both Elijah and Moses are two figures that really speak to the, um, the hope of God's uh, act, the eschatological event uh, that was coming into play. In fact, you get this sense by both of them being there that this this anticipated climax now is, is at hand. Uh, and so I think when we ask that question of why Elijah and Moses, it's because those two figures factor so significantly in the, the great plan now coming to the end. Um, you know, and, and, the, and those who would accompany me will be part of that, those figures, part of that eschatological reality. Now, Peter's response I find very interesting, and Peter also gets maligned for his response, and, and I think to some extent uh, uh, that he does as best as he can, perhaps, in that moment. First, Peter says to Jesus, Rabbi, and, and I don't think that Rabbi should be any indication of somehow not understanding. I mean, Jesus has been Teaching. So I think the rabbi here is, is, a, is an acceptable designation. Uh, he says, let us make three tents. So you could also look at that as, as, as three uh, uh, booths or three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And uh, I think, you know, in, in some respect, recognize that what Peter is doing first is he is seemingly making an incredibly high statement about Jesus. Here was... Elijah and Moses, these great figures from the past, now visible uh, there in the present, and Peter is counting Jesus among them, you know, which is in itself a really amazing statement about Jesus. But I think also the, the booze is interesting because the, these tents, these tabernacles, because it's hard not to think about the festival of booze here as part of Peter's thinking. You know, the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles was, was celebrated uh, usually in sometime what we would say September or October by our calendar after the Grape Harvest Festival and two months before the Dedication Festival. 
It, it, it followed the Day of Atonement and marked the conclusion of the annual cycle of religious festivals. But what's, what's fascinating, I think what's important to note, is this Feast of Tabernacles, what it does and how it's presented throughout the scriptural story. It begins, when you look at Leviticus and Numbers, um, as, as a uh, recalling God's provision for the people in the wilderness wanderings, where they you know, lived in these tabernacles. But then it takes on in Nehemiah and then in, in Zechariah more than just a remembrance of what occurred, but becomes a declaration, one of, of present dependence and trust in God, becomes part of that fe- festival that he will continue to, to meet. That's how it sort of gets associated with this harvest idea, that he will continue to meet the needs of his people. But with the Zechariah a- a- aspects uh, that get pulled in, there's a eschatological aspect to this festival as well. And, and suppose what I'm asking us to think about is when is this festival of booze carried almost the full story of God uh, interacting and acting with his people from the uh, Exodus event uh, to the continual sort of uh, you know, sustaining of the people to a forward future looking hope. And I wonder uh, then with Peter, when he is saying, let us make three tents or tabernacles, if he's trying his best to draw upon the, the greatest expression of uh, past, present, and future in terms of, of uh, Jewish festivals by saying, let us make three tents. Let us, let us do a tabernacle representation here. And so there's part of me that when I think about uh, Peter's response, I want to give him some credit for trying to figure out the best way to respond to this moment. But of course, there, he, he misses some of the significance here. For example, uh, the fact, one of his mistakes is that he wants to make three instead of one. He's, he's missing the significance that uh, Eli- Elijah and Moses being there is uh, in, in witness, if you will, in affirming what, what Jesus is doing. That it is not Elijah, Moses, and Jesus, but it's Elijah and Moses bearing uh, witness and testimony to what now is occurring uh, with, with Jesus' arrival. And, and I think that's even stressed, for example, is, is that uh, even after the moment is over, the stress is on uh, that there's still Jesus there, that Jesus remains, that, that there's a significance. But of course, the voice as well brings this in. So you, um, you, you, you have Peter uh, verse, in verse 6 sort of just trying to figure out what to do. He did not know what to say. He, he's terrified. And then almost interrupting into this scene is a cloud overshadowed them and is this voice, this is my beloved son, an echo of Psalm 2-7. Now, this is not the first time we've had this occurrence happen in the Gospel of Mark. This is very similar to the baptism uh, in the, where the, the voice you know, from the heavens and, and the heavens were split, ripped apart, and the divine testimony comes into this royal psalm declaring who Jesus is. And so we get that reminder that, that this is the significance of, of who is, is being in viewed here. But notice also, I think this idea of listen to him becomes important. The Father is endorsing advocating for the son's words. Now, in this mosaic imagery, the mountain, the theophany, the, uh, um, uh, the bringing of the witness, those elements that we talked about before, you have uh, Deuteronomy 18.15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. This is Moses being the like me. From your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And, and I think what we have here then is, is this clear declaration with listen to him, that, that Jesus is this one that Moses spoke about in Deuteronomy 18. It's hard, it's hard to miss that. And then this then reminds us of what Mark has been stressing all the way through this, that Jesus had an authority unlike the scribes. That, you know, the scribes debated and discussed what Moses meant. And here is the one who's even more important than Moses being affirmed, you know, to, to listen to him. 
And so, so we have this scene, and then uh, uh, as they're coming down the mountain, he tells uh, the three not to tell anyone, not to tell anyone about this glorified uh, transfiguration they have witnessed, or, or that Moses or Elijah, uh, until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And so you even have there, uh, in this messianic secret, this, this, uh, um, uh, this relationship that Jesus is wanting to connect, that I think what Moses and Elijah and, and God in the voice are affirming, can only be fully and truly understood after the great Son of Man, Jesus, you know, uh, resurrects. And so the, you have these bringing together. And even Jesus talking about resurrection here would be an eschatological understanding. And perhaps that's a bit why the disciples have some confusion. So in verse 10, they kept the matter to themselves. It's one of the few occasions where Jesus tells someone to be quiet about something, and they actually are. Uh, so we, we want to give them credit. But questioning what the rising from the dead might mean, and I think that's important for us to continue to remind ourselves, is, is when we look at uh, the disciples and they, they don't seem to get what Jesus is saying when he keeps talking about how he will rise again on the third day or the Son of Man must be risen, that for them the resurrection was not something that happened in the middle of history to one person. The resurrection was something that was supposed to happen at the end of history to the faithful people of God. And so when they're sitting here talking about what do you think he means when he says that until the Son of Man had risen from the dead, it's because they, they, there's no place in their understanding of how things are, you know, should play out in their mind that fits this. One, a resurrection being associated with the Son of Man doesn't fit, but also a particular person rising from the dead as opposed to the collective would be something that they're just would be struggling with and that they wouldn't you know have the um the benefit that we have of looking backwards into this and knowing what jesus is talking about they did not and i think we need to always recognize the difficulty that they would have had of course with these references to resurrection with these references to uh, elijah and this vision of elijah it's natural that they asked him about the role that Elijah plays in all of this. And, and keep in mind that this question about the role Elijah plays with that also probably stems from the fact that there are people um, saying that Jesus is Elijah. We already saw that when Jesus asked the disciples, who do the crowd say that I am? And they replied, some say you're Elijah. So the Elijah uh, atmosphere is, is certainly ripe. And so they ask him, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus' response is interesting, and actually the logic, I think, sometimes is a bit hard to follow here. Jesus responds first with uh, seeming to affirm what the scribes are saying, which is a rarity. Uh, you know, Jesus doesn't usually affirm the correctness of the scribes, but he says Elijah does come first to restore all things. Now, you know, this, this idea that Elijah, you know, comes first to restore all, all things, coming off Malachi Four, five, six, which reads, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. And, and, and Elijah's arrival, you know, his departure feeds into this uh, mystery of his arrival too in Second Kings 2.11 and how Elijah... Um, you know, uh, leaves. And so this question then becomes about Elijah coming first, and Jesus affirms it. And even says Elijah does come first to restore all things. But yet after making that statement, and not even really defining what restore all things means, he then issues a statement about the Son of Man. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. This was one of the point of debates. Jesus has been saying that it, that it is uh, necessary that the Son of Man be rejected by, by the leaders and be, be, um, uh, be killed. And the, the uh, disciples are having a hard time understanding how the great victory of the Son of Man can at all be connected with what seems to be such a horrible prediction. And I believe what Jesus is doing here by saying 
first affirming the Elijah statement, but then connecting it with his teaching on the Son of Man is challenging the disciples to rethink what Elijah coming to restore all things actually means. And for, he says in verse 13, but I tell you that Elijah has come. And, and, and this is seen as Jesus' uh, reference that uh, this Elijah figure was John the Baptist. That John the Baptist is, the, is, is fulfilling this Elijah um, uh, requirement. That Elijah has come and they did to him whatever they please as it is written of him. And this would be the connection between uh, this would be the statement about John the Baptist who was executed by um, Herod Antipas. And so in this statement, what Jesus is doing is saying, just as I, you must rethink the victory that the Son of Man brings, you must also rethink the Elijah forerunner and what that would look like. And so if the restoration of all things is, is pointing towards the great uh, victory over all things, but yet, yet the great victory over all things is, is in suffering and death, then it makes sense that the restoration is also in similar garb, that the, the Elijah figure would suffer similarly. In other words, the great restoration of all things is to be understood in what Christ is accomplishing on the cross. That this, the great suffering of the Son of Man on the cross is indeed the great victory, and, and, and Elijah, John the Baptist, pointing towards that is the restoration, and that, uh, this, that John the Baptist is preparing the people for the arrival. And so I think this is how what Jesus is trying to get them to understand here is uh, the statement that Elijah does come first to restore all things is not incorrect, but that their understanding of that uh, is incorrect. We're going to see something similar even happen in Mark 13 when we get uh, get to that chapter. All right, I want to continue uh, then here thinking through Mark chapter 9 and looking here at verses 14 through 29. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. Uh, and, and so the, the scene is right, this is the returning to the disciples. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd said, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out. and They were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, How long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. They went on uh, from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know. Looking at here, this this passage in in 14 through 29 is, is, is fascinating here. Uh, fascinating, because we've, we've moved from this, this great moment of, of transfiguration back into the sort of every day of Jesus' ministry, which is uh, the disciples uh, not getting something right or being confused and the need for um, help and aid uh, in, in the demonic 
uh, exorcism. We even have evidence that this demon has been around for a while since this, since this boy's childhood, that he's destructive as we would expect. We continually see uh, the demons trying to be destructive. And here this is something we, we have as well. He's trying to destroy the boy, throwing him into fire, throwing him into um, uh, water. But what's, what's interesting is the, the, there are two interactions First, uh, this first interaction is, uh, is with this man, and this man is, is, is pleading for help. He's gone to the disciples, and they were not able to do it. Which we know the disciples have just come from a ministry experience where they were able to cast out demons. And then we have, and, and before Jesus turns to engage with the man, we have this uh, this rebuke by Jesus, O oh, faithless generation, which, as we've talked about, I really believe that this, this negative generation language is to, is to connect what is currently happening with the doubt um, of the Israelites that were wandering the wilderness. And so I think this, O oh, faithless generation, you know, this present generation has unbelief. But then he turns uh, in, 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 into this with, with this with this father, and the father uh, is who's brought, who's made the muscular act, if you will, of trying to get uh, this boy to Jesus. He asks the question, "But if you can do anything, help us." And Jesus is indignant at that response. And it's it's the it's the "if you can" language. This is in stark contrast to "if you are willing, I will be clean." Here is, if you can, please do this. The if you can language uh, indicates uh, that, that uh, the man has some concern that Jesus' power may be sufficient enough. And the reason he has this concern is because the disciples have shown themselves to be insufficient to the task. And so he, this inability of the disciples has now... Um, been uh, transferred over to a concern over inability of Jesus. And, and so the, uh, uh, the, the challenge Jesus gives back to him is, uh, with all things are possible for one who believes, is a challenge to show faith. And we've seen this through Mark, that Jesus uh, wants a muscular response, wants a clear response of, of faith in, in, in Jesus before he will respond uh, in the miracle. If one does not believe um, that Jesus can do this, then Jesus does not do this. That's the pattern we've been seeing in Mark. And then we have, I think, probably one of his greatest statements about, uh, about faith. Uh, and, 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 a, and a statement, I think, that really encapsulates the right response. The father of the child uh, cries out two things. One, I believe. Well, that in and of itself um, uh, could simply be a response to, oh, oh, I do believe. But it's the second statement that perhaps shows even more faith. Help my unbelief. It is this humble recognition that uh, there is a lack of faith there but that that lack of faith is his own weakness, and, but the, and that Christ is the one who can grow and solidify the faith. And indeed, uh, this, this, this is a, a, a great cry, uh, I think, of, of discipleship, that the disciples themselves are not getting. The, the, we're going to see play out how often the disciples are quite confident in their abilities. They, 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 they show a lack of uh, um, concern over inabilities. In fact, some of their boasting that happens later on regarding uh, who will be great and who will be greatest, or even Peter, when we get to um, uh, the, the final and the Passion Week and his bold declaration that, you know, if everyone else falls away, he will stay with Jesus till the end. That, that they work in this sort of boldness statement, and perhaps what they need is, help my unbelief. And so the, Jesus then uh, receives this statement as evidence of faith. And, and he rebukes the unclean spirit, 
Um, there's, a, there's a command there and an immediacy of that command. Now, that is uh, what we would expect. Um, now, it, this whole moment actually seems like something we've seen earlier in the Gospel that characterized the first eight chapters, if you will. But we are in this section on teaching, where the, the attention from Caesarea Philippi uh, has been Jesus teaching the disciples. And one of the things that does stand out in, in this element is the, teaching ele- is the teaching aspect that occurs. So we have, uh, after the exorcism... Uh, uh, we have him sort of enter the house and him having this discussion with the disciples privately. This is uh, looking here at, at, at verse 28, where they're asking, why could we not cast it out? And the response is interesting. This, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. So the question, of course, is why they could not do it, but yet Jesus could. And the heart is the disciples' failure. Maybe part of the answer is, is in this response to Jesus. Jesus says this could only be cast out by prayer. And I don't think what he means is a specific formula or saying. But rather it's that posture of prayer. That, uh, uh, that dependence that prayer is. You know, prayer is, a, is, is when one turns their face to a God uh, in a declaration that God is creator and, and we are created that God is the one who, who designs and directs and, and, and we don't have anything to contribute on our own. And maybe we're getting this hint when Jesus responds by this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer that the disciples were beginning to think about more what they were able to do on their own rather than realizing a need for the power of, of, of God in this. So the response I find interesting. I want to quickly uh, um, begin uh, moving on uh, here and, and maybe finish out chapter 9 if we could. So I'd like to look at verses 30 through 50. They went off from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, uh, "Sorry, excuse me." Uh, saying to them, "The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise." But they did not understand the saying and were ref- afraid to ask. Um, I want to talk a little bit about those those two verses. One of the things that we notice here on these two on these two verses is that we have our our next passion prediction. We've been seeing Jesus do this. This is our our next one in verse thirty one. And so here we also have a reason for the um, messianic secret, if you will, in this aspect that he's telling uh, the disciples not to tell anyone about what they know because he has teaching he wants to do, and and if the spread you know, continues of his popularity, uh, it might prevent or at least make difficult some of this teaching. And so he, he, uh, he predicts he's going to be delivered. And I, but one thing I think is important to note here is he's going to be delivered into the hands of men. And I think the hands of men might indicate in this prediction who is doing the delivering. If this isn't a delivering from um, from one group of men to another group of men. And notice this isn't handed over to the rulers or to the, the judges or to the leaders, my, uh, uh, you know, a particular group. It's into the hands of men. And I think then what we're seeing here is, is in verse 30 run that the, the one who is actually delivering the Son of Man over to the hands of men is, is God. I think that's the, the idea behind it, that God is doing this delivering. And this would actually fit with what uh, is said of the suffering servant in Isaiah. He is said to be delivered over. Paul will use very similar language about delivering where God is the one who delivers and hands over. And so we're getting, I think, a hint at the divine orchestration of, of the passion as well. And they will kill him. Uh, again, uh, I think evidence that this is uh, not a creation of the early church is the language of kill him instead of crucify him which is what one would have expected if it was an insertion 
uh, into, into the scene. And when he is killed after three days, he will, he will rise. And then verse 33, And they came uh, to Capernaum, which is not a surprise. This is usually where, when he's his home base, when he's in Galilee. And when he was in the house, uh, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? Verse 34 is interesting that they kept silent. Uh, uh, and I think, I think as we're starting to see, disciples will often keep silent when they know that uh, there's some embarrassment or shame associated with it. But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Now this, this argument with one another about who was the greatest uh, uh, seems especially uh, egotistical in uh, you know, a 21st century Western context. But keep in mind, in the ancient world, where everything was understood in, in honor and shame, that they would be uh, boasting in themselves a little bit about who would be in what status it wouldn't have been as uncommon. And, and Jesus clearly speaks against it. But that they were doing that would be reflected, uh, would be reflective rather of uh, that culture where the, everything seemed to be a, a competition. Now, so this, uh, they, they realize that this is uh, uh, inappropriate. I think that's why they kept silent, that they've, they've been listening enough to Jesus' teaching to know that what they were arguing over is probably something he won't agree with. And indeed, he does make this a teaching moment. Uh, he sat down and called the Twelve. That has that idea of seating, has the idea of now there's going to be a, uh, a lesson on it. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all, and so this is the uh, the the teaching objective, if you will, that the rest of it is going to follow. This is the main idea, sort of this reversal of how you understand status. Whoever receives one such, uh, and he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said, "Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me." Now, I want to I wanna just finish there, and, 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 and we may have time to do the rest of nine. If not, we'll pick it up at the next lesson. I'm sure we'll pick it up at the next lesson. But I think what we need to realize is what's happening here in terms of what a child is in the ancient world uh, and a little bit to how we think naturally uh, of a child. When we, when we think of, of a child, especially uh, in the West, we tend to think of child as the perfect display of, of innocence, of, of having been... Uh, you know, untainted, of potential, uh, you know, ready. Um, in a lot of ways, a child in the ancient world wasn't thought of in similar ways culturally. And I'm not talking about a father and a son in their care, I mean, a father and a wife in their care for the son or daughter, but children in general were a group that lacked status. Uh, ch- children were a, a, a group that had no sort of social significance, if you will. They were dependent, they were weak, they were unable to contribute. And so when, when we look, Jesus has said, he's talking about this distinction between one, these, this argument the disciples are having about who's going to be the greatest and to display the importance of uh, this reversal of first and last, he picks not something innocent, but something of low status and low value. The child becomes the expression of, of, uh, of, of um, uh, a, a lower ring in the honor, shame category, if you will, as, as the, the world would understand it. And so what he says is, is whoever receives one such child, and I don't think this means that whoever receives children, but I think the child here is the, is the metaphor, perhaps, is the best way of putting it, or the symbol. Whoever receives one such low status, whoever doesn't think status in my name, and I think the in my name reference here is interesting. Does it go to the receiving or does it go to the child? That's, that's one of the debates. Is it whoever, we, whoever in my name or receives in my name one such child? Or is it whoever receives one such child in my name? Meaning the in my name associated with child. And I think the sense of it here might be to associate the, the in my name language with child. Right? In other words, whoever receives uh, a low status person who is a follower of mine, who, is, who claims to belong to me, receives me. 
This is much more closer to what we usually uh, we've seen uh, Jesus say about how the reception of uh, the followers of Jesus is the reception of Jesus, and and you know to reject the followers of Jesus is to reject Him. You know to reject the message that the um, uh, the disciples are carrying is to reject uh, the one who, but who the message proclaims that that Jesus continually interweaves throughout His teaching the connection between reception and rejection of His followers with reception and rejection of Him. And I think this is what's happening in this context that what Jesus is saying: whoever receives um, uh, the the lowliest of people in social status world, but who claim to be a follower of mine, they are receiving me. They are receiving, you know, the, the, the Messiah. And whoever, and conversely, whoever receives me, whoever says, yes, you know, I welcome Jesus uh, into, in, into my presence, uh, receives not me, but the one who sent me, right here being a reference to the Father. And, uh, and as we work through thinking about children and metaphor, I want us to keep that in mind, because I think what, what we're going to see this plays out is, is, is it's about social status, not about purity, innocence, uh, and and potential. I want to pick up the rest of chapter 9 and as we move into chapter 10 uh, the next time. Thank you. This is Dr. Mark Jennings in his teaching on the Gospel of Mark. This is session number 15 on Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 50. Transfiguration, Boy with Demon, Discipleship. Thank you.